Good morning. I'm speaking to you this morning on disorders of keratinization, a very broad topic. But to begin, the epidermis in the newborn provide the function of transitioning from the aqueous intrauterine environment to the gaseous terrestrial environment, and in so doing provides for the essential functions of mechanical protection, thermoregulation, immune surveillance and barrier function. The um, keratinocyte terminal differentiation culminates in the replacement of the plasma membrane with the cornified cell envelope, which in turn becomes encased with lipids forming the cornified lipid envelope. And the two together form the major contributors to an effective cutaneous water barrier. And where one or both is compromised, increase in transepidermal water loss and increased susceptibility to infection ensues. There are 54 keratin genes in humans, broadly characterized as types one and two, and these form obligatory heteropolymers that form the basic building blocks for the intermediate filaments of the cytoskeleton that contribute to mechanical stability. Additionally, they can be induced, particularly following injury, photoradiation exposure, and influence basic cell cycle um, functions such as cell cycle progression, metabolic activity, apoptosis, and cell migration. To mention that these keratins, even in health, are distributed in different um, abundance at different epithelial surfaces, can be induced by hyperproliferative states, wound healing, and photoexposure. And by way of example, showing the normal epidermal human epi er, epidermis, where K1, 2, and 10 are found in greatest number, whereas contrasting this with the hyperproliferative psoriasis state, where 6, 16, and 17 are most, most influential. And if you contrast this even with the hugely thickened dolphin epidermis, five and six times the thickness of normal human epidermis, six and 17, the inflammatory or proliferative um, keratin genes are most abundantly expressed. Broadly, um, disorders of cornification are classified as um, hereditary disorders, those that are genetically influenced or acquired disorders. And for the um, purpose of this morning's talk and accepting its time constraints, I'm going to discuss the most commonly occurring or the most serious. So ichthyosis vulgaris, X-linked recessive ichthyosis, lamellar ichthyosis, and congenital ichthyosiform erythroderma. But you can see from the detail um, in the slide that this is a far, far broader topic. So this is an example of collodion membrane or collodion baby. And this is the clinical phenotype that applies to a, a large number of ichthyotic conditions but usually the majority clinically are determined as um, ichthyosiform erythroderma or lamellar ichthyosis. The baby or the neonate is surrounded by a very tight, tall, shiny um, transparent membrane that's thought to resemble cellophane that has a number of characteristics, one of which is that the stratum corneum is massively increased in thickness, but in spite of its thickness, in fact, is a very defective um, barrier, serves very defective barrier purpose. And because of this, these neonates are very much at risk of thermal instability, hypernatremic dehydration, infection, sepsis, pneumonia, both as a consequence of restriction of ventilation, but also through aspiration of amniotic fluid containing shed keratinocytes. Restrictive defects include ectropion, eglabium, and even hyperplasia of the nasal and auricular cartilage. So the majority of collodion membranes evolve to either congenital ichthyosiform erythroderma or lamellar ichthyosis, and a smaller subset in the order of 5% are described as self-healing collodion baby. Treatment of these infants is their management in a very humidified um, environment, use of bland emollients, attention to their risk of thermal instability, monitoring their fluid intake and output, monitoring their electrolytes, and also where there are exposed surfaces, in particular mucosal surfaces, protective padding and lubricants. The most common of the inherited ichthyosis is ichthyosis vulgaris, thought to affect between one and 250 of live births. It's characterized by scaling that can be generalized, but often picks out the lower limbs where it can be thickened and more pronounced. Hyperlinearity, particularly of the palms and soles is considered very characteristic and also sparing of both the face and flexural sites. It can be associated, the scaling, with perifollicular hyperkeratosis or keratosis pilaris. It's a filagrin deficiency disorder, and colleagues have elucidated this very extensively. And those patients sometimes have an associ association with atopic disease and or atopic ocular disease. It never manifests in the first three months of life, 
typically has its onset in the first year and does persist throughout an individual's lifetime. And these are photographs of um, the extent of scale that can be generalized, but also on the um, further right, examples of the keratosis pilaris or perifollicular keratoses. And this is a very characteristic aged hand appearance of a hyperlinearity of the palms. X-linked recessive ichthyosis is, re uh, is a result of a steroid sulfatase, an inherited steroid sulfatase deficiency. It affects um, affected males in, of an incidence of between one in 2,000 and one in 6,000 um, live births. Uh, it's usually evident before a baby is three months of age and doesn't present with collodion membrane. In particular, extensor surfaces and very characteristic, considered almost pathognomic, is involvement of the preauricular sites and the lateral neck, described as characteristic dirty neck appearance. These scales are dark adherent scales, contrasting the ichthyosis vulgaris, palms and soles are spared. And in the affected male fetus, there's an increased production of dihydroepiandrostenodione and also a reduced placental production of estrogen. And both of these things put that infant at greater risk of hypogonadism, undescended testes, and genitourinary anomalies. In about 10% of affected males, there's contiguous or larger gene deletions, Kalman syndrome, where the ichthyotic presentation is accompanied by mental retardation, hypogonadism, and anosmia or in the instance of contradysplasia punctata, where there's very characteristic stippling of the epiphyses noted. So these are the clinical appearance, and as commented, the involvement of the lateral neck, very, very characteristic, these larger, um, darkly pigmented scales on limbs and trunk. Lamellar ichthyosis, by contrast, is inherited as an autosomal recessive disorder. Affected babies present with collodion membrane, and these scales as the collodion membrane is shed, scales replace it and they're very large and plate-like hyperpigmented, centrally attached, detaching peripherally with deep fissuring allied. The extent of erythroderma is considered usually minimal, but alopecia and ectropion in these affected individuals can be severe, even resulting in exposure keratitis in those affected. It, it's acquired as a consequence of transglutaminase 1 um, mutation, affecting the integrity of the cornified envelope but its genetics are considered heterogeneous. It can, in early infancy or neonatal period, be difficult to distinguish from congenital ichthyosiform erythroderma. And in that neonatal period, supportive measures really is the remit of treatment, contrasting with older children or adults where keratolytics and retinoids have their uses. And these are the clinical examples. And again, these very broad um, plate-like scales, pigmented, and almost in the case of the affected limbs, um, tessellated scales, so plate-like scales, contiguous. Um, further photographs demonstrating in particular the extent of ectropion and also evidence of alopecia affecting the frontal hairline. So associations that run with lamellar ichthyosis include in, in heat intolerance, scarring alopecia, eclabian, and severe ectropion, sometimes complicated by loss of eyelashes, conjunctivitis, and exposure um, keratitis. <clears throat> Ichthyosiform erythroderma is inherited autosomally recessively, has its onset at birth, again presents with collodion baby, and erythroderma is substantially more commonplace. The scales are finer and lighter, considered almost powdery or feathery, and palms and soles are affected with diffuse fissuring keratoderma. Alopecia and ectropion, although associated to a much lesser extent, contrasting with lamellar ichthyosis and neurological disorders, it can also be associated. And in this instance, it's extremely important to consider that this may be part of a multi-system disorder, neutrolipid storage disease being an example, and important to identify on peripheral blood sm smear where there may be role to influence the outcome of disease with dietary modification. So these are the very characteristic slides with this light feathery adherence scales, very, very different to the previously shown lamellar ichthyosis. And again, the um, extent of erythroderma uh, in the backdrop. So to mention that the management of these disorders is variable, it very much is dictated by the symptoms and severity of disease that varies from one patient to the next. And um, the principles um, that underpin treatment include hydration, lubrication, keratolysis, particularly in colder environments and particularly um, in milder disease, humidification may be very beneficial to the point of in substantially improving disease. Bathing is particularly effective. It provides an opportunity to soften and debride hyperkeratotic stratum corneum, 
but also an opportunity to use lubricating bath oils, ointments and creams, some of which um, may be the vehicles for keratolytic agents, urea, salicylic acid and alpha hydroxy acids, lactic acid and glycolic acid, all possibilities. Both urea and propylene glycol have their uses um, as humectants in differing concentrations, but bearing in mind, particularly where one chooses or considers to use occlusion as a means of enhancing absorption, it's coupled with an increased risk of toxicity and salicylicism, particularly in younger um, children and patients, um, is characteristic um, of this. And additionally, infants or children, because of their increased body surface area per unit weight when compared to adults, have a heightened risk. Topical vitamin D and topical retinoids have usefulness, however limited frequently by irritancy in these patients who have an impaired barrier function. Um, in severe disease, really retinoids is the preclude of treatment. Both isotretinone and acetretinone have benefits. They both can decrease scale, improve a patient's heat tolerance and sweating and diminish the, or even reverse the extent of ectropion. They also reduce the risk of infection. Acetretin probably better than isotretinone, but bearing in mind there are choices to be made and discussions to be had around its teratogenicity, particularly in the case of acetretin, where because of its slow elimination and particularly those women who may wish to choose pregnancy in the shorter to medium term, it very much limits their choices and pregnancy should be avoided for up to three years in the case of acetretin. So the doses schedules are outlined above, variable between um, 0.25 to 2 milligrams per kilogram, tolerance allowing in the case of isotretinone, typically between 10 and 25 milligrams in the case of acetretin, onset of benefit usually in the first one or two weeks. Again, as mentioned, a robust pregnancy prevention plan in females and in the case of those patients who are treated with retinoids the longer term, to be aware of the risk of skeletal toxicities, dish type changes, and that periographic radiographic skeletal surveys may be beneficial in that sense. It completes my talk. It's been swift, it's been brief. I hope it's been beneficial to you. It's a broad and rather fascinating topic. And unfortunately, it's been very limited uh, this morning, but I hope it's been valuable. Thank you.